and welcome back, everyone, to Double Down with Breslow, where we cover everything going on in the sports gaming business, sports gambling, uh, internationally and domestically. We've got recent developments we've been covering coming out of uh, Kentucky, which is about to go live. Florida looks like it's finally going to break through and go live. And one of the other major developments that we've been covering is esports. And is gaming going to come to esports or gambling coming to esports? In the gambling business, we like to call it gaming. And then it gets confusing, though, when we start talking about video gaming. But here to break down all that is a guy who's been at the forefront of bringing gambling to gaming, Ari Fox, the CEO of Gamacon and of CEC Live. Ari, welcome to the program. Uh, thanks for having me, Jim. I appreciate to be. I appreciate you having me on. I it's a it's a it's an a obviously growing topic, but I it's, I'm excited to talk about it. Well, and I appreciate you coming to us from the Death Star. Uh, we started talking about this off camera, and uh, and I stopped you because I wanted you to explain to everybody uh, why you have the Death Star behind you and and your history of your yourself in the video gaming space. Well, you know, if you go back to when I was a kid, uh, you know, video gaming first came out. I've always been f um, a fan and fascinated with uh, technology and computers. Uh, and from what we started in watching, you know, uh, George Lucas's film Star Wars to where we are today, you can imagine we've come a very long way. And yeah. I, I was I was very taken by that. And I've always been taken by that. And that thus we're sort of like, you know, do what you love and everything will come after that. Right. Right. So do you have all the Star Wars collectibles from when you were a kid that are now worth so much money? Uh, some uh, some of them uh, along the way got divorced. I lost some. My ex-wife. Oh, no. <laughs> she, took, she took your Star Wars collectibles in the divorce. Yeah. What a horrible story. I'm I'm a baseball card collector and I've been through a divorce, but I made sure she did not get any of those cards. So that must have been that must have been a rough divorce. Yeah, you know. <laughs> Don't well, like the to other, hear off the dirty laundry here, but you know. <laughs> the other thing is uh, you know, unless you've got them in the original box, you right. know, the value is pretty limited, right? Exactly. I mean, you have to you can, sort of a collectible is something that you have to not touch at all. Yeah. You know, like, but as a little kid, if you get a, if you get a, you know, the a Darth Vader or, uh, or something like that, you want to take it out of the box and, you know, play with it and everything like that. But, uh, you know, I, I, I don't, I didn't do that. Um, so, you know, I kind of had an early idea of like the value of money, um, yeah. which is, which is besides being a nerd and involved in, you know, loving video gaming, I, I, I also, understand uh you know the aspirations and the desire to uh make a dollar <laughs> well i have a similar story so you know i was a pretty serious baseball collector card collector as a kid not just buying the packs but i would go to the the trade shows and buy the old mickey mantle and willie mays cars but i was always buy the one in the absolute worst condition because i could get that one for a buck and the other one was 10 bucks and i'm yeah. like no, no 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 so i've got all these amazing cards that have the corners ripped off and tears yeah. and it's on uh, and, they're, and, and they're worth next to nothing today and if i just paid a few extra bucks the thing would be worth thousands yeah well this is why you know we started our event uh because we're trying to help the casino industry which i started my career in about 25 years ago uh we're trying to get that industry to be to get in while it, while it's fresh and new uh so it can be worth more money later on um, right you know right. and that's that's the very good segue my friend yeah, I'm I'm a, I'm a born naturalist when it comes to doing this kind of stuff. So before we get to that, just t tell us what what were the games that you grew up on? I'm I'm curious since you and I well, are similar I mean, there ages. Was, there was Pong, and then you know later on, um, you know we I started playing the Sega Genesis uh, and all the games that they were offering, mostly the console stuff. But then, do you remember the um, the the Coleco the the football game? Yeah. Oh, the oh, just the dots? little handheld. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So that was like a huge, and not only that, as, as I started, I went to private school. So, uh, I was in a Dungeons and Dragons group. Yep. Yeah. You so, were a real nerd. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> I, I remember, I remember hearing about Dungeons and Dragons, uh, in school, but yeah, that's funny that you reminded me that that was like the first, you know, handheld device. That's like the cell phones of today. 
was these little football devices where you're running down the field and, yeah. and avoiding the tacklers. Well, it was so easy to fake it out too. So you, you would just jump to the top and then every, you have the whole defensive line jump that side and then you just go around and you would go around and then you, obviously it's a touchdown, five seconds. Now so you I'm figured thinking, that out. I never figured that out. Oh yeah, no, it was easy. I also figured out Rubik's Cube too pretty quick. So that was... <laughs> so, so, so most of us eventually, you know, moved on from video games, but not you. No, I was you always... you remained an avid player and fan from from day one. Yeah, and I've seen such a growth in it, and so you know, having that that interest in it, um, and then being pulled away, sort of. I mean, like you say, a lot of people, you know, I had to find something that I liked as well, but wasn't too far out of my comfort zone, and that was the casino industry, uh, because it also involves games and stuff like that, and money, the two topics I love the most. So, um. The question there was, um, and me getting involved in it, in it, you know, over 25 years ago on the gambling side in the marketing stuff, uh, we started, I started getting more in the marketing side of things. Where, um, where were you working? Well, we started in Atlantic City yeah. um, and we had a company called Fox Marketing and Fox Marketing did special promotional projects that, um, you know, at the time we, we actually started with printing and we were doing ads and bus schedules and things like that for all of the gray hairs that were taking the buses down to Atlantic City. It was a big program then. And then it sort of gradually um, that changed and the casino industry decided that that wasn't really a great uh, ROI on it because people were literally just taking the buses to, to collect the $25 that they got when they got off mm. the bus. And go hang out on the beach. Yeah, or the buffet, the beach or the buffet. So after that, after that situation, we realized, uh, you know, I think there's a future for the, the, the video gaming world to sort of merge with the casino world. And that really came to a head when we ran a consumer conference called GameCon at, uh, at the casinos in Atlantic City. And at that time, it was during the recession. So 2006, 2007, we, these ideas started coming around. And we thought, what would be a better way to do something than to honor the game developers that created these games? And we we decided to have a game con event for all these indie games, which is sort of like a Sundance Film Festival type of thing. And within that, we had esport tournaments. And this was even before anyone had even thought about, you know, wagering on esports or esports even being in the picture of, you know, something that was larger than uh them just a tournament itself or having a, you know, what they call land parties local access network parties where you just sit down and play a video game with a bunch of friends and give out a prize at the end so it's become it's come a long way since we started doing uh these events and um from what we started the obviously the lowest hanging fruit for the gambling industry was the competitive side of video gaming which is esports Mm -hmm. um, and I always say this to many people is, but that's like the small section of the video gaming world. Mm -hmm. um, it's not the actual overall 3 billion video gamers. Uh, and I have right. to say people that are just, in other words, people that are sitting at home just playing games as opposed to playing in, you know, professional tournaments. Well, not just the professional tournaments itself on the professional side of it. That's the, the, the actual people playing professionally is even a smaller microcosm of the overall people. I'm talking about there's think of it in this way. There's the video gaming world. Um, think of high school. And then you had your your jocks and your nerds. And the jocks obviously played actual athletes, sports, baseball, football, the, the sports, and they were competitive in nature. Um, and then the nerds would sit on the sidelines, but they would watch those guys play, but they weren't actually the competitive guys. They were just guys that like to have fun doing other things. So the overall community, if you take the 3 billion gamers worldwide, only 10% of that 3 billion, which is still a pretty large number, are people that like to play competitively. Um, video games. That means I challenge you to play uh, for high score. If you go back to this uh, Space Invader days, it was a high score type of uh, player versus player type of experience. Who could get the high score? That was the bragging rights. Today, it's so competitive. It's like how many kills do you get in a Call of Duty match? 
um, you know, what is, you know, and that kind of thing is what is the, is what the bragging rights are or how you win a match. And it's now actually a sport in a lot of ways, but that community as a whole of the 3 billion is only 10%. The rest of gamers play games like, uh, they call them exploratory games, like Zelda, Skyrim, uh, Arkham City. These are games that uh, are played, like you play against a computer. Or you could play, you know, uh, Grand Theft Auto is a game where the you could play against other people, but at the same time you can, you know, it's like sort of in the middle of exploratory as well as like competitive. Um, so there's there's a lot of that that is out there. Um, and a majority of the people that play video games like to play these exploratory games or what they call uh, role-playing games. So mm -hmm. you, you fall into a character and you play. So the numbers character. you're giving is 3 billion players worldwide. Three, 3 billion video gamers worldwide. Three, and then you're saying essentially 300 million, 10% are playing, um, or, or is that 30, 30, 30 million, I should say. Yeah, competitive video gaming. Or, or 300 million, yeah, playing competitive. And then how about how many are watching other people play games? Well, those numbers are around. You can you can accept or think of, but you have to realize that younger people watching video games are going to watch it really like at, in a sporadic moment. So at any given time, you can have anywhere from, you know, depending if it's like the League of Legends championship series, you can have like 300 million to 400 million viewers at any given time. But that's not a steady watch. That's like I pop in for five minutes to check out to see what's going on. I pop off. You remember younger people, um, Gen Z millennials, they can do like five, six different things at one time. And so their attention spans are absolutely like this. They're tiny, short spans of uh, that you can get their attention, which is why advertising and marketing finds it so frustrating to even talk to these people, like to get any kind of message out. Mm -hmm. is very difficult so, so when they're watching though they're watching what you would call professional players right they're watching okay. professional players so like i said the league of legends championship series which is held in katowice poland they have a big uh they, they were throwing events there they were having finals there but they can have finals anywhere it depends on where that circuit's designed where that circuit's set up um and where they're going to have it, you know, it roams just like the Super Bowl in different cities mm. around the world. But video gaming and esports is worldwide. And that's where we're coming at because it's it really had its explosion when games like Doom uh, and other games like that were first launched on the on the Internet. Um, and um, that's when it started becoming much more of a a world sport or much more of a world connected type of thing because obviously if you're sitting in you know uh sydney australia and i'm here in new york i could play a video game with you if you happen to be up at that time uh in the middle of the day or something like that and you can make friends and connect with people worldwide through gaming and uh, that's that's how these communities function it's similar to when you could go to a baseball game and you see someone who's a fan of the New York Yankees, obviously you have a connection with them. You have something in common with them, the game of baseball, as well as the game of, as the team that you're rooting for. So that happens, but it's much more of a broader sense because you're talking about a world population as opposed to the, you know, downtown Bronx, you know, uh, bomber fan base. So it, it, it's got much more of um, cap the capabilities of making a lot more money than, and, and there's these esport these e tournaments going on 24 seven all over the world and they never stop. There's no season. So it's a constant thing. So there's an, always the ability to bet on a video game competition someplace, somewhere. And what is the Super Bowl of these competitions? I would say it depends on the, so you have to think of each individual game as an each individual sport. So if we think of games like uh, uh, Rocket League, League of Legends, uh, Valorant, uh, uh, some of those, these are, and the ones I'm mentioning are, are games that are normally played 
right now on the college in the college ranks. Uh, but there's around over 400 universities now that are offering esports, and not only scholarships for esports, but as a professional collegiate uh, program, uh, just like their other athletic programs. So there. So the the question then is um, the championships of these at this point are just developing. I would say they're in their their beginning stages. But if you have something like the League of Legends Championship Series, which is that would be the, if you ask me what's the Super Bowl, that has the largest amount of eyes on it. And that is the, uh, if you, so to speak, the Super Bowl, uh, think of League of Legends as comparative to the NFL mm -hmm. or football. So as I was saying before, the different games like uh, Rocket League, League of Legends, et cetera, think of them as separate sports, baseball, football, basketball, soccer. They're literally separate games just like those are separate games but the video gaming side of it is separate games so when people talk about esports they usually throw it under one umbrella but it's multiple games under that one umbrella and then the, you have professional teams that actually have divisions under that organization that play these different types of games Mm -hmm. So for the Super Bowl of gaming we'll, we'll call it the League of Legends championship how many people are watching that well, there was statistics based uh, that were done, and they said that at one point it had it was it was higher than the NHL Stanley Cup Finals, but it was also comparatively the viewership was about the same as the Super Bowl. Wow. So at any Amazing. point in time, yeah. Amazing. All right. Well, when we, we got to take our break, when we get back, we'll talk about how we're going to meld gambling with what you've now described as this industry, which is essentially as big as you know the major sports things that are out there. We're talking to Ari Fox, CEO of Gamacon. We'll be right back after these messages. Hi, everyone. I'm Veronica Dudo, and welcome to Buy, Hold, Sell. If you have the Russians that are going into Ukraine, the Americans and the Germans and everyone else in Europe is going to say, hell no. If Russia doing things, you know, logically was their MO, I'd agree with you. Yeah, Todd, why don't you get him on, on a phone call right now? Hello? <laughs> you Welcome back to Double Down. We're talking to Ari Fox, CEO of Gamacon and CEC Live about esports and the merging of gambling and esports. So we've kind of been brought up to speed now as to where the gaming industry is. Uh, let's talk about now how gambling has merged with it. So. Just tell me the story about when was the first time anyone legally gambled on esports? When and where was it? It's funny you mentioned that. I think um, if you go back to the late seventies, early eighties, there was a competition for for Space Invaders, and it's 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 rumored that there was a wager placed on who would get the highest score. It was held at the University of Georgia. And it was a there was a tournament for space invaders. So if we could go back to that period of time, it wasn't legal, obviously, under the sanctions of the of any state, considering it was in the state of Georgia. Obviously, nobody was watching who was doing what, but there were bets probably being made at that time. So I it it's hard to say, but I could tell you that the first regulated uh, legal bet on esports happened. Uh, in, I think it was in 2014 or 20, no, 2016 at, at, in Atlantic City uh, at uh, the Borgata, I think. And I think that uh, Governor Murphy or somebody was one of the first people to place a wager on an esports tournament. And it was League of Legends Championship Series. And you're saying first in the world, not just U.S.? I'm talking about the U.S. Uh, okay. As far as the world is concerned, I, there have been many offshore dark market um, esports wagering uh, platforms that have been out there. And um, it really I could, I could tell you it really only started when the the professional side of it started to come more uh, into the into the into the view of the general public. Mm -hmm. So. As what about that? What about the legal books in Europe? Were, were they ahead of the U.S.? Well, the legal books in Europe now um, are definitely ahead of the U.S., but they're playing. They they usually wager in a different game. It's called CS:GO, 
which is it's Counter Strike Go. It's like Call of Duty, but it's very popular out in Europe. It's yeah. getting more popular here. And when it started there, it's really hard to, you know, really hard to pinpoint when the first wager was placed on an esports. But we have to also realize that it's less than one percent at the moment in esports wagering. At least legal wagers that have been placed on esports is less than one percent. If you look at the books in regards to where the wages have been placed, but it is it is growing. It's wait, growing. wait a minute. When you say less than one percent, one percent of what? Point point zero nine percent of wagers that are are are, are what has been wagered on esports. That's the business for esports wagering is mm -hmm. point zero nine percent. So we're almost at that 1% mark, but if you, that's not including the offshore, um, uh, offshore wagering that are not legal in places that, you know, are, you know, no one's watching the, the legality or protecting the consumer. These are offshore sites that have been taking wagers on esports for quite some time. Now, we're also not including or talk, discussing in regards to this peer-to-peer -peer wagering which means the, that's something else that's coming into the, the purview or the, the view of the, the regulatory markets in not just the United States, but also worldwide, is that if I challenged you, Jim, to a game of uh, Call of Duty or uh, some kind of one-on-one -on -one match like Rocket League or something like that, I bet you 20 bucks, you bet me 20 bucks, and then they take a VIG, whoever's putting up that, you know, whoever is, whatever platform we're playing on will allow us to play against one another and then we can win whatever's left in the pot. So that's something else that's coming in as a discussion in regulatory uh, districts like places like New Jersey, at least in the United States. As far as Europe is concerned, they, they already do have peer-to-peer -peer wagering. Peer-to-peer -peer wagering has also existed, um, again, in offshore markets. You know, just like the iGaming uh, industry, internet gaming, and some of these other um, uh, businesses that have been around now almost 20 years, they started offshore and then ended up becoming uh, regulated and out of the dark. Same with sports wagering, because it was only legal in about three states in the United States. There was a lot of, um, you know, dark markets. Now there's not. It's much more. But, the, you know, the, AM, the AGA, the American Gaming Association, still has their hands full in going after these offshore and dark market comp uh, businesses because there's limitations to uh, and regulations that are hampering the growth of the sports wagering industry. Now, you know, as you mentioned, some of these newest states that are going to be getting sports wagering, like Florida and some others, they're doing well. They're going to they're going to make money on those taxes. But how well is the actual business doing? In other words, the sports wagering platform, which is, you know, why we can talk about now bringing esports in and then mm -hmm. possibly as another way to earn more revenue, because, you so know, we it's, got about, it's volume based. We got about approximately 30 states right now, right, that have online sports betting uh, or, or it's coming online. How many of those also allow betting on esports? Uh, I think New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and I think that's about it. At wow. This point. Yeah. Wow. And so I'm I'm kind of wondering why, because in in New Jersey's had it for quite some time, right? Yes. New Jersey's so had it for quite some time. What's your analysis as to why these states, when they're approving sports betting, are not just throwing in comma and esports? Well, you also besides the the offering of esports, the question is. Um, I mean, for people in their over 50, okay, you can, you can understand that a, a gambling establishment, whether that be online or in a brick and mortar created a, um, environment that, um, attracted or still attracts people of a certain age. Correct. So the, the younger people that are betting and wagering on esports or into video gaming, um, that environment hasn't developed yet. And so when we work and do our event at the CEC Live, that's exactly what we're talking about. How do you create that environment that even if you're offering something online for them, how do you create that environment that's going to um, 
make them feel comfortable, make them understand that this isn't where my parents and grandparents play, whether that be online or in a land-based casino. Um, it's place for me. And I, I can do things here that would make me comfortable. Now that's happening because sports wagering is finding that a lot of people who are 21 and older who are sports fans are also gamers. So they're also beginning to, beginning to realize that they can either offer them peer-to-peer -peer wagering uh, or sports betting itse itself. I mean, esports betting itself. So, but how do you entice the customer that is goes on a sports wagering app FanDuel, DraftKings, et cetera, which by the way is offering now esports wagering as well. How do you make and entice that younger audience to also understand that you can wager on esports? Mm -hmm. But you also have to understand there's it's a very different kind of fan in the video gaming spectrum. Um when you when it when you watch another gamer, meaning video gamer, play a video game, you admire the person and how they can use the character to pull that move off or to get that kill or to read that map or whatever it is in the game that they're actually doing. But you also know that when you see that, you have the same capability to do that. So the um, sort of the, the worship of the Adonis or the worship of the, of the, of the athletic God, meaning like, could I ever become a Derek Jeter or could I ever become a Reggie Jackson is not there. You can become a Derek Jeter. You can become a Reggie Jackson. So the admiration for that person who could do that move, you know, is not the same kind of relationship that a fan for uh, a professional uh, traditional sports group would have. I mean, when you see sports fans at, at football games and at baseball games, these are guys who are ex-athletes or these are that watch those games and or older guys or even younger guys that know that they can never reach that level of, of professionalism in that, in that spectrum. With video gaming, it's very different. Well, and, so, and another interesting distinction that I'm thinking of is that in sports, you're seeing the person who you're betting on or the people that you're betting on play. Here, whoever you bet on, you're not really seeing them, or or are you seeing? Them? Are they showing them in a little corner? You're more, of the you're more of a fan of the actual game itself, of the characters, of right. the way that they're moving, of predicting who will get the next kill, which is similar to who will get the next three point shot in an NBA game. But the this the 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 relationship between the actual game itself, meaning the video video game. And the fan or the better is very different than the relationship between a professional football team to the fan of that professional football team or that football game. Mm -hmm. now, and, I, that's, heard, and that's the thing we have to figure out. So uh, somebody I interviewed recently said that betting on esports is as much as 10% of sports betting in Europe. Does that sound right to you? Mm. Yeah, is that legal or is that regulated or unregulated? Regulated. I wouldn't. I would say it's a little less than that. Okay, but but regardless, Europe is way ahead of us when it comes to people Absolutely. betting on esports. Absolutely. Okay. So, would you say therefore it's been a success in Europe? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But but, but they have but they have their hands full in Europe because they they're having um, the issue with responsible gaming. So a lot of the countries are stepping in. The governments are stepping in and saying, "Well, this guy's already bet X amount of dollars or X amount of whatever uh, euros. That person's limited because this is how much they make on a daily basis or a yearly basis, and you're above your head. So we're cutting you off now. Come back in a month from now. Mm. What do you do then? Well, what you do then is you still have to engage that person. And that's where the um, environment comes into into play. So, so, so tell me if if Europe is ahead of us, and for the most part, it's it's been successful there. So, what is the lesson to be learned from Europe that the U.S. companies uh, and states need to put in play for us to replicate that? Keep keep doing it. Uh, stay stay on the road. Don't don't waver. It'll happen. You just got to keep keep doing it. I mean, you just got to keep offering it. You have to have events uh to the consumer that engage that that person whether that be online or at, in a land base open your business up to understand that 
you will invite or can invite uh, video gamers to, to a place that makes them feel comfortable. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think that's the, that's the disconnect we're having in the United States because mm -hmm. the original esports business, that bubble popped. What was that bubble? That bubble was let's copy exactly like what they do in professional sports. Let's build arenas. Let's make money on ticket sales and merchandising and sponsorships. And that, that model has failed because it's, that's not the, that's not the, that's not the sweet spot for the fan of a video gamer. Mm -hmm. they, they don't want to go to an arena to watch it. They want to watch from home. They're, yeah, they could is simply watch from home they can watch on their on their on their cell phone but how do you engage that person like what can you do that will make them more apt to uh you know get involved in you know um making or placing a wager yeah i mean it sounds like we don't have a problem getting them to watch there's tons of them watching these tournaments the the, the thing is to get yeah besides the watching though give them an opportunity to play for something like maybe a free headset Play against so so while they're what while they're not watching their best team that's up on the stage during that actual professional esports uh, match, give them something else. Remember, we're talking about people that could do lots of things at the same time. Give them many things that that they can get involved in. Are and, these teams known well enough that people can make an educated bet on who's likely to win? Well, there's there's statistical companies that give those stats out. Uh, I mean, some of them are not, they're, they're given to the actual bookie. They're not given actual to the punter. But the actual person who's placing the wager can find out these statistics out on different type, on these different gamers. It's all public knowledge online. But but are they also essentially celebrities? Just like you know, let's, let's compare it to Wimbledon. So you got a bunch of tennis players playing, and we know the top twenty. We don't know the others so much. Is are that they, kind of the way it is? Well, with, the, with, the question is: Is are they celebrities for their player? Are they celebrities for their personality? Because remember, you have the the, the sort of world of media and influence has now merged into these uh, what they call esports organizations or teams. And what they've changed these organizations and teams into are media companies, really, because their model of building a, a star esport player is not had didn't never took on that traction. That person who is that esports player who's really good, what people were attracted to was their personality. Now, if they didn't have a good personality and they couldn't really connect with somebody online, they're not going very far, and they don't get the kind of um, uh, response by an audience for people to follow that person as a player um, as much as someone who actually can interact with their audience. We're talking about a very different kind of fan because, like I said, with the people who play professional sports today on conventional levels with the NFL and baseball stuff, they never have to talk to their fans. I mean, some of them do. But and it's happening more and more. But you'll you may see that more and more that they interact online with their fans. But on a, in the digital world, the fans want to know that player like they all like they want to hear about um, an actor uh, on on Instagram or a singer. You'll see all of these people, all the people in entertainment because we really talk about esports. You're talking about entertainment and sports. It's a sort of a merger of the two. It's very different than actual sports sports. Is FanDuel and DraftKings advertising to these viewers of these games to try to get them to, to, to bet on them? No, I don't so think that, that I don't think that they're doing that. You know, I don't think they're doing it in a, in a way that they can. Um, I think they're doing it with what they know and what they know is sports general straight sports but like in new jersey for instance if i'm streaming games on whatever network that is that also has advertising you would think that the sports betting companies in new jersey would somehow be feeding ads to those people that are watching in new jersey i haven't seen any and honestly there's i think that's a very that's a big disconnect to the to that audience that does play video games uh and that does wager on video games i think that that they're not doing a good enough job i think FanDuel and, and DraftKings are not they're sort of offering it it's it's there it's on their platform that you can wager on an esports tournament 
but it's not a pronounced like I wouldn't know. I guarantee if you walk up to any video gamer that's 21 or older, um, they know that FanDuel, as soon as they think of FanDuel DraftKings, it's it's sports wagering. I'm going to bet on the NHL. I'll bet on a baseball game. I'll bet on a football game. As far as esports is concerned, oh, I didn't know they had esports. That's what you're going to get. Because they it's 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 sort of stuck in a little corner over there. And uh, it, it happens to be if that person meanders on their platform, we'll find it. But All right, well, let's not, we, we, we got to wrap up. So let's let's sum it up. Is it ultimately going to be successful in the U.S.? And if so, what's what's the breakthrough moment? Um, it will be successful in the U.S. Uh, mark my words. It's it's probably one of the only reasons that I'm still talking here. <laughs> But it will be successful. Esports will have its day in the sun. Um, but overall, the only way to really understand how to connect to that audience is to attend my event, which is the Casino Esport Conference. It's going to be, it's called CECLive.com, and it will be uh, held uh, in Atlantic City. Uh, this is our second time in Atlantic City. We've been around eight years now, based in Las Vegas, but now we're doing one in Atlantic City. So it'll be October 18th and 19th, uh, 2023, and two weeks after the Global Gaming Expo. But definitely a must attend for companies on how to connect to a younger audience and how to build that esports wagering platform. Okay, awesome. Ari Fox, CEO of Gamacon. We are going to stay tuned to see when this breakthrough happens. And yep. uh, I'm, I'm sure you're going to get a lot of credit when it ultimately does happen. So hopefully everybody's going to see you in Atlantic City. Uh, what's the website again? It's CECLive.com. All right. All right. Thanks so much for coming on. Thanks, Jim. Thanks for having me. All right. And thank you all for watching and listening to Double Down with Russell. We'll be back soon with another episode. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.